Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, as you can tell, I uh, am not uh, the wise uh, Morton Blackwell, um, but I am lucky and fortunate enough to be your MC for this Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast. Uh, we're glad that you're here, and I checked the weather this morning, and it looks like there's a 100% chance that everyone's going to have an amazing day today. So really excited about that, and some more good news is that the rain will part uh, this afternoon. We're going to see the sun. Uh, it's been, I think, since Thursday since that's been prevalent, so it'll be great to get the sun out and uh, really hopefully indicates uh, brighter things are on the horizon, especially as we look towards November. So one last thing I'll say real quickly at the beginning is just that our hearts and our prayers are with the people of Florida as they go through what is the worst hurricane since 1935, as it's being billed right now, especially the people of Tampa uh, just really have uh, their, th their, their struggle in our minds. It's in our forefront, and we hope the best for them as they continue to recover. So good morning and welcome to the Leadership Institute's October Wednesday Wake Up Club Breakfast, October. It's wild that we're here already in 2022. I encourage you all to live tweet today's event. The hashtag is available on the screen, hashtag WWCB. And in 2022, the Leadership Institute, your Leadership Institute, has already trained 9,550 conservatives in 403 trainings. 403 trainings. And since 1979, LI has trained more than 250,000 activists, students, and leaders. And currently, that number is 2,000, uh, 200,052, 494. You have before you uh, our schedule for the remainder of 2022. Please take a moment to review our upcoming schools and consider attending one or sending a friend, a strong conservative friend, to one of our trainings. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Shakira Jackson for the Invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Shakira is currently interning at the Leadership Institute in the Digital Training Division. Yes, and she's doing a fantastic job at that. Uh, Shakira graduated from the University of Pittsburgh, where she majored in political science and history and graduated in three years. I think the mean and average right now is about five years, so three years is pretty quick. While at the University of Pittsburgh, she founded and served as the president of the Network of Enlightened Women and the Students for Life chapters. Uh, Shakira is continuing her education at Georgetown University, actively working on her campaign for city council uh, in Philadelphia. All right, Shakira, if you wouldn't mind coming up. So, shall we all bow our heads for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, may nothing separate us from you today. Teach us how to choose only your way today, so each step will lead us closer to you. Help us walk by the word and not our feelings. Help us to keep our hearts pure and undivided. Help us to embrace what comes our way as an opportunity rather than a personal inconvenience. Thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives. Thank you for your goodness and blessings. Thank you for your great love and care. We ask you to bless the speaker today and everyone who speaks through this mic, oh God. We ask that you let us think with an open mind and take all we can from our speaker today. Thank you for your sacrifice that we might have freedom and life. Forgive us when we don't thank you enough for who you are, all that you do, and all that you've given. Help us to set our eyes and our hearts on you, Father. Renew our spirits, fill us with your peace and your joy. We love you and we need you this day and every day. We give you praise, honor, and glory. You alone are worthy, and we appreciate your wisdom and your knowledge. May you continue to bless the Leadership Institute. In Jesus' name, amen. And I will now lead you guys in the Pledge of Allegiance, so if you will all stand. I pledge allegiance. Thank you. All right. And now it is uh, my pleasure to introduce Amanda Spears for the program report. 
Amanda is the Leadership Institute's Christian Leadership Program Manager, a very new exciting program that's happening at Leadership Institute. And she travels to college campuses across the country to identify talented Christian students on college campuses and recruit them for mentorship by the Leadership Institute. She connects these students with training, networking, internships, and job opportunities throughout the conservative movement and in Christian movements, helping them take advantage of the opportunities presented to them and develop them into future Christian conservative leaders. Amanda was homeschooled throughout high school and is now attending Liberty University online towards a degree in business management. Uh, Amanda, if you wouldn't mind. All right, well, I'm excited to tell you all today about the Christian Leaders Program. It is one of the newest programs here at the Leadership Institute, and its mission is to recruit and identify, perfect, um, to recruit and identify strong Christian leaders across the country. So once we find these students and really form the relationships with the Christian colleges and the faculty across the U.S., we are able to plug them into LI trainings, mentorship, and apologetics training, which from there we can help them understand why they believe what they believe and help them understand the importance of being involved in the political process. So this is the first semester that this program has kicked off, and we already have 56 students that are active members of the program, many of whom are already um, graduates of LI training or are about to become graduates from trainings in this fall and spring. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Amanda. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Joseph Meyer, uh, to introduce our speaker, I apologize. Uh, Joe is uh, interning at the Leadership Institute in the Donor Services Division, one of our most important divisions. And uh, Joseph is from Stewart County, Tennessee, and attends Austin P. State University, ASPU, where he is pursuing a degree in political science, which is very exciting. Uh, what's even more awesome is Joe joined the Tennessee National Guard uh, halfway through his senior year of high school, and he's served there for three years. Uh, Joe, if you wouldn't mind introducing our speaker. All right. Oh, Kay Meyer. Kay Meyer. Yeah. Kay Meyer, no, you're good. It happens. All right. So this is going to be the last introduction before our guest speaker comes up. All right. So Michael New, PhD, is a research associate, or yeah, a research associate, a political science and social research at Catholic University of America, as well as an associate scholar at Charlotte Luzier Institute. Additionally, he is a fellow with the Witherspoon Institute of Princeton in New Jersey. Dr. New has both a PhD in political science and a master's degree in statistics from Stanford University. He has served as a postdoctorate fellow at Harvard MIT Data Center and a lecturer at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. His articles have appeared in various peer review peer-reviewed journals, four of which have been examined for the impact of state-level abortion, abortion legislation, and I think most prestigiously, a former intern here at LI. So now if you please just give a big round of applause for Dr. Michael New. Uh, thanks for the very kind introduction. Uh, you know, Joe is correct. I am a former Leadership Institute intern. Uh, this is kind of a homecoming for me. I'm showing my age a little bit here, but I interned back in 1998. Uh, I interned for Todd Stewart. For Todd Stewart. Uh, I wrote direct mail, which I found is very challenging. Uh, I'd write these direct mail pieces, and they'd come back covered in red ink, uh, but it was a learning process. Uh, but I have really good memories of that internship, and there are probably some interns here today. One of my fondest memories uh, was that I was doing some work in my cubicle, and I saw one of the uh, other staff people kind of walking around. He looked a bit distraught. And I asked, what's happening? He goes, you know what? I'm directing tomorrow's student publication school. And one of our speakers just canceled. And I don't know what to do. He looked at me. He goes, wait a second. You're ready for your school paper, don't you? Which I did. I wrote for the Stanford Review, which is one of our oldest conservative campus papers. And I said, indeed. And he says, can you speak at our school tomorrow? I said, you're on. So I dropped everything I was doing. I wrote a talk. I dragged a poor intern probably down to this exact room. We timed it. 45 minutes. Good enough. I gave the talk the next day. It got good reviews. They actually kept inviting me back. I became part of the faculty at the student publication school. So interns, you know, always find a way to make yourself useful. It, uh, it pays off in the end. So I have a PowerPoint. Hopefully this is okay, great. 
So, basically, we have a talk called Pro-Life Success in the States, Strategies of the Post-Roe Era. So, you know, I'm a social scientist. You know, I write about abortion trends, pro-life laws, public opinion, contraception programs. I'm a lot of fun at cocktail parties. But when I give a talk, there's lots of data, lots of information. So, pay attention, good information, but it's going to come at you pretty quickly. So, before I begin, a couple quick commercials. Uh, one thing I do every summer is I teach at something called the Vitae Institute at Notre Dame. The Vitae Institute is a week's worth of pro-life instruction. There are lectures on theology, philosophy, law. I usually do one lecture on the social science. So it's really great. You get to meet 30, 40, 50 pro-life people from all over the world. And best of all, if they accept you, it's free of charge. All you have to do is get yourself to South Bend. Uh, your meals and accommodation are paid for. It's one of the highlights of my summer. So if you have questions about that, uh, talk to me afterwards. I'd love to see you in South Bend this coming summer. Another quick commercial. Uh, I was actually the first associate scholar at the Charlotte Lozier Institute. Uh, that is the education and research arm of Susan B. Anthony List. I used to say that we were a new think tank. We're really not that new. We're actually over 10 years old now. Uh, but I'm very proud to be associated with Lozier. Uh, that for a long time, the only group doing research on sanctity of life issues was Guttmacher. And Guttmacher, up until 2006, 2007, was the official research arm of Planned Parenthood. So for the longest time, we needed a pro-life think tank, and I'm glad we have one now. So please, you know, look them up. Uh, they have a Facebook page. Uh, look them up on Twitter. Follow them. Uh, we have research and analysis on pro-life issues every day. You know, we have lawyers, we have public health experts, we have social scientists. So lots of good research and commentary on pro-life issues. Uh, I can't recommend them enough. So I do a lot of writing on pro-life issues. And when you do a lot of writing, you get lots of invitations to speak. So for different audiences, I have different presentations. So sometimes I'm at a conservative event. And it might be a fundraiser, it might be a gala. People want to be entertained. So have a fun talk for conservative events. Sometimes I'm at a breakfast meeting. You know, breakfast is the first meal of the day. People want some information. They want to get the day off to a good start. So I'm speaking at a breakfast gathering. I have a serious talk. Well, today, I'm at a conservative breakfast, so I'm going to try to give a talk that's both fun and serious. So I hope I can pull this off this morning. So, some exciting news. We did it! Roe v. Wade was overturned. Years and years of blood, sweat, tears, and prayer all paid off. And I think this really just is a real testament to the dedication of pro-lifers. You know, we had our ups and downs uh, since Roe v. Wade, but we never gave up. You know, we always prioritized this issue. We always thought it was important. We made the Republican Party a pro-life party. We emphasized strong judicial nominations, and we got Roe v. Wade overturned. So a lot of people worked very hard on this, and really hard to see our efforts finally pay off. Now, here's what this presentation is about. First, the good news. Even before Dobbs... A lot of folks don't know this, but even before Dobbs, pro-lifers are making quite a lot of progress. One thing we did that I think was very successful is we cut the abortion rate by more than half since 1980. In 40 years, we cut the abortion rate in half. So that's the good news. The better news is now that Roe v. Wade's overturned, we're going to make even more progress. And that's really exciting. So we're making progress even under Roe, but now that we actually legally protect pre-born children, we're going to do even better. So let me just talk about the pre-Dobbs pro-life success story again. The U.S. abortion rate has fallen by more than 50% since 1980. All this happened while Roe v. Wade was still on the books. In fact, this is a success story I think we should do a better job promoting. It's interesting that, um, you know, when I give talks to pro-life audiences, I have two statistics I'd like to give. The first is that the abortion rate has fallen by more than 50% since 1980. The second, just bear with me, it's a secret, I'll let you know later on, but for the most part, right now, I just want you to remember that we've cut the abortion rate in half since 1980. It's kind of interesting that usually when there's a big public policy success story, it gets lots of attention. You, know, you think about things that have gone well, like the fall of communism, or declining crime rates in New York City, or even the decline of the teen pregnancy rate. This gets lots of attention from academics and journalists. But we've cut the abortion rate by more than half since 1980. And almost nobody notices. You know, outside a few analysts who really care a lot about this issue, it gets almost no attention. And it's also surprising. Because to be honest, public policy did not change all that much between 1980 and 2020. So if I stepped into a time machine and went back to 1980, and suppose I had a chance to talk to pro-life leaders back in 1980, 
and sitting at the table are Jack Wilkie, who ran National Right to Life, and Mildred Jefferson, who was also involved with National Right to Life, and Nellie Gray, who ran the March for Life, and Joe Scheidler from Pro-Life Action League. And I said, listen, I've seen 2020, and we did our best, but as of 2020, Roe v. Wade's not overturned. But don't despair, because actually between now and 2020, we cut the abortion rate by half. I think they'd be skeptical. I think pro-life leaders have been very surprised in 1980 to learn that we actually cut the abortion rate by more than half without actually overturning Roe v. Wade. But that's what did happen. So we've actually made quite a lot of progress. I think it's a success story. We should do a better job promoting. Now, something happened. And again, it's also important to remember that, you know, this is making a real difference. If the abortion rate today was still at 1980 level, there'd be one million more abortions taking place every year. So our efforts are really paying off. I would say there's millions of people walking around out there who owe their lives to the pro-life movement. So if we had not gotten the abortion rate down, there'd be a million more abortions every year and a million more women potentially seeing a lifetime of regret. Now, you see, this is, you know, a trend line showing the abortion rate. You see after Roe v. Wade, it goes up. It peaks in 1980. And with a couple of hiccups, it goes down pretty consistently since then. Uh, this is the same data, just a different time frame. Mother Jones, a, a liberal magazine, uh, you know, even people who don't agree with us do agree on, you know, the legality of abortion do agree that abortion numbers are going down. Now, the narrative is important, too. Uh, our opponents will concede abortion numbers are declining. Of course, they'll bend over backwards to avoid giving us any credit. So, one thing that's interesting, I've been working on pro-life issues since the 90s. I probably joined the pro-life movement my sophomore year in college. One thing I've noticed is that we've made some gains in the court of public opinion. Our opponents often like to try a new strategy. They don't like to argue pro-lifers are wrong. They like to argue we're ineffective. You know, they go, it's so great you care so much about unborn children. But if you cared so much about unborn children, you'd spend money on welfare programs or public health care or contraception. Well, the thing is, you know, we have research about what works. And the things that work are programs that encourage sexual restraint, passing pro-life laws, changing hearts and minds, assisting pregnant women. All these things have a demonstrated track record of success. The things our opponents try to confuse us with, like welfare spending, again, there's not one peer-reviewed study that shows that spending more money on welfare gets abortion numbers down. There's also not one peer-reviewed study showing that universal health care gets abortion numbers down. And there's not one study that shows that more government spending on contraception programs gets abortion numbers down. So the things that pro-lifers are trying to do have a track record of success. The things their opponents are trying to confuse us with have no track record. So important to stay the course. So why did the abortion rate fall? Before I get into why it fell, let's talk about some incorrect explanations, which you probably have heard from our good friends in the mainstream media. So are some incorrect explanations for the abortion decline? Well, one is the election of President Clinton and the election and re-election of President Obama. And I guarantee you, I can almost see the future. Uh, in 2024, I'm going to pick up a newspaper, and there's going to be an op-ed. It's going to be an abortion. And the op-ed is going to say, you know what? It's great that pro-lifers care so much about getting abortion numbers down. But you know what? In the 1990s, we elected President Clinton. He supported legal abortion, and the abortion rate fell. In the 2000s, we elected and re-elected President Obama. He supported legal abortion, and the abortion rate fell. You know, therefore... If pro-lifers want to get abortion numbers down, they should elect presidents who support abortion, like President Clinton and President Obama. Well, as anyone who can take a stats 101 can tell you, correlation is not the same thing as causation. Yes, it's true we elected and re-elected President Clinton. Yes, it's true we elected and re-elected President Obama. And yes, it's true that abortion numbers fell, but didn't have anything to do with anything either president did. In fact, I stay up all night last night trying to think of one thing either President Clinton or President Obama did, to get the abortion rate down. And honestly, I couldn't come up with anything. So what you saw was just a durable decline that just kept going through two Democrat presidential administrations. Another incorrect explanation, contraception. Now, here it is true that constant use has increased. But in many cases, so the unpaid pregnancy rates. This is data from the CDC. This is the percentage of women who've ever used a certain kind of contraception. You see, since the early 80s, numbers have gone up. It's the percentage currently using different forms of contraception. So again, you know, looking at the data, you know, numbers, in fact, have gone up. But look at the unintended pregnancy rate. You know, you don't see a consistent decline. According to this Guttmacher data, the unintended pregnancy rate went up after 1994. So, you know, obviously, when it comes to contraception, you know, I think that, uh, you know, 
Obviously, people might have different ideas about the morality of it, but just the research behind it shows that it's not an effective strategy for getting abortion numbers down. Contraception use is going up, but you see actually an uptick in the unintended pregnancy rate. Uh, this is new data from Guttmacher. Um, and once again, you know, you don't see a consistent downward decline in the unintended pregnancy rate. You see fluctuations. You see the unintended pregnancy rate actually increase between 2001 and 2008. Point in time of contraception use was actually going up. So again, you don't see a consistent, durable downward decline in the unintended pregnancy rate like you do with the abortion rate. So the fact that more and more women using contraception doesn't really seem to have much of an impact you know, on the abortion rate here. Again, because if it were, you'd see a consistent decline in the unintended pregnancy rate, and you don't. Another explanation. It's another good one. Lavish fight for Planned Parenthood. You know, Planned Parenthood says, just give us millions upon millions of your taxpayer dollars. We have these wonderful sex education programs. You know, we have one of these wonderful contraception programs. We'll get abortion numbers down. Okay. Well, let's just take a look again at the data. State of Texas. They eliminated funding for Planned Parenthood in their state family planning program in 2011. They got a lot of criticism for this. A lot of public health experts complained bitterly. They said this is going to be a disaster. You're going to see a big surge in teen pregnancies. You're going to see a big surge in the unintended pregnancy rate. The Texas State Legislature got a lot of grief uh, for removing Planned Parenthood from the state family planning program in 2011. But look what happened in 2011-2019. Minor births went down by 64%. Minor abortions went down by 64%. Does this look like a public health disaster? This looks pretty good. I think a lot of states would love to have the public health record of Texas here. So again, they quit funding Planned Parenthood. And again, in fairness, some of these numbers are going down before the funding cuts. But clearly, you can still have positive public health trends without requiring taxpayers to fork over millions of dollars to Planned Parenthood. So, last ex- correct explanation, welfare spending or universal health care. Again, some people have credited the Affordable Care Act for abortion numbers falling. But the Affordable Care Act took effect around 2011. The abortion rate started to fall in 1980. So, again, there's no research showing spending more money on health care welfare reduces abortion numbers. These are important issues we should care about. We should, you know, want people to have high-quality health care. We should be compassionate toward poor people. But this is not a substitute for passing pro-life laws. So here are the incorrect explanations. The election of Democratic presidents, more use of contraceptives, fighting for Planned Parenthood, well, for universal health care. So why are abortion rates falling? Remember my two favorite pro-life statistics? First is that the U.S. abortion rates fallen by more than 50% since 1980. Here's the second. A small percentage of unintended pregnancies result in abortion. Or looking another way, if a woman finds herself with an unintended pregnancy, she's a lot more likely today to carry that pregnancy to term. So here's some of the numbers on that. That you know, I'll do a new slide here. You see that in the early 90s, half of all unintended pregnancies were aborted. Between 2015 and 2019, that fell to a third. So again, I will put this statistic up in front of any pro-life audience that will pay attention to me. Why is this so important? Why do you think this statistic is so important? The fact that at one point, half of unintended pregnancies ended in abortion, and that number fell to a third uh, with, in over 30 years. Yep, hearts and minds. That's that's correct. What else? Well, it's very simple. Why is it important? It shows we're effective. If more unintended pregnancies are being carried to term, it all flows back to the activities of pro-lifers. We're either shifting public opinion, caring for the material needs of pregnant women, or enacting protective pro-life laws. So I think it nicely shows that pro-life, you know, educational service and legislative efforts have all been effective over the past 40 years. So, why are fewer unplanned pregnancies ending in abortion? Changing hearts and minds, pregnancy help centers, state-level pro-life laws. I'll talk about each of these things in turn. So, public opinion. This is the Gallup poll. You know, every year, Gallup always asks people a simple question. Do you identify as pro-life or pro-choice? The light green line is pro-choice. The dark blue line is pro-life. Look at 1995. In 1995, only 33% of people identified as pro-life. But look at 2021. The number rises to 47%. So we gained 14 points in the court of public opinion. You know, that's a real gain. 
you know, the fact that more and more people identify as pro-life, you know, I think helps us a lot. So, you know, in terms of shifting public opinion, you know, we've had some success. And I can talk about this in more detail. We've also had some success, you know, with young people. You know, there used to be a big kind of age gap when it came to opinion on abortion, where, you know, the elderly were very pro-life and young people were very pro-choice. That's really not the case anymore. You know, there's still a gap, but it's not nearly as big. You know, Students for Life is doing some great work. Uh, a lot of other groups doing some great youth outreach. More and more young people identify as pro-life. As a professor, I've really noticed a big change you know, over the past 20 years or so. And again, why are more people identifying as pro-life? You know, I think what happened in the 90s was important. You know, some of you younger folks may not remember this. We had a big debate over the partial birth abortion ban. I think that was very really savvy of pro-lifers to really focus attention on late-term abortions. Uh, the fact that we had pictures of aborted children, you know, in newspapers, in magazines, on TV, that couldn't be ignored. I don't think ultrasound technology is playing a very important role. You know, I think very often the first picture somebody sees of a son, daughter, brother, sister, niece, nephews in utero. So again, um, I think that's having a subtle but very important, playing a very a subtle but important role in this debate. Pregnancy centers. You know, we've actually are opening up quite a lot of pregnancy centers. There's a lot of two good trends here. First, abortion clinics are closing. Between 1991 and 2017, the number of abortion facilities fell from over 2,100 to just over 700. So two-thirds of abortion facilities that were open in 1991 have closed. And more are closing now, which is a great thing. So I lived in Michigan for a while. We had a nice tradition. Anytime an abortion facility closed, we threw a party. So I thought that was always a great uh, occasion to celebrate uh, the fact that, you know, fewer abortions are happening and fewer people are involved in the abortion industry. While abortion clinics are closing, more and more pregnancy help centers are opening. Between 1998, 1988 and 2015, the number of organizations offering assistance to pregnant women almost doubled. It went from about 2,100 to just over 4,000. So abortion facilities are closing while pregnancy help centers are opening. Two very good trends for the pro-life movement. So there's nearly 3,000 pregnancy centers here in the U.S. providing services to over 2 million people, relying on the help of 71,000 volunteers who do over 5 million hours of uncompensated work. And again, every time I speak to a pro-life gathering, I always encourage people, please you know, identify and support a local pregnancy resource center. You know, a lot of these groups are running on very small budgets, but doing a lot of great work helping people in very tough situations. Uh, I'm on the board of the Northwest Center, which is one of our pregnancy help centers here in D.C. Uh, we have our fundraising ball uh, coming up not this Saturday, but next Saturday. If you're interested in going, uh, please talk to me. We'd love to have you. But please, whatever you can do, Help your local pregnancy resource center. If you only give a little, then give a little. Sometimes a little goes a long way. So they're really on the front lines, doing a lot of great work, helping women in need. And lastly, legislation. You know, certainly in the 1990s, you know, a lot more states to enact pro-life laws. So you see, we see a big surge in state-level pro-life legislation. 1992, only 20 states had enacted a pro-life parental involvement law. Again, these are laws requiring that minor girls either notify their parents or receive permission from their parents for obtaining an abortion. That number went up to 37 states by 2021. In 1992, only 18 states had what we call Casey-style informed consent laws. Again, these are laws that require women seeking abortion to get information. Information about alternatives, information about, you know, field development, you know, information about health risks involved with an abortion. You know, only 18 states had Casey-style informed consent laws in 1992. 29 states had them by 2021. Only 21 states were regulating abortion facilities in 1992. 30 states are doing so by 2021. And again, no states had banned partial birth abortion by 1992. 21 states did so by 2021. So we really made a lot of progress, you know, in the 90s and 2000s, passing more and more laws at the state level. So why was this? Well, a couple of things. First, we had the Casey decision back in 1992. And when that was the, you know, prior to Dobbs, the really only time the Supreme Court really reconsidered Roe v. Wade. And back in the 1990s, a lot of pro-lifers really expected the Supreme Court to overturn Roe. And when they didn't do so, it was a setback and a disappointment. But there was a silver lining. Even though they didn't overturn Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court did uphold much of the Pennsylvania Abortion Control Act, which was signed by Governor Bob Casey, uh, into law. So that basically gave pro-lifers the ability to do more legislatively at the state level. The, the Abortion Control Act had a parental involvement law component, had an informed consent law, had a waiting period. So the Supreme Court mostly upheld you know, the Abortion Control Act, that made it much easier for pro-lifers to pass a lot of these state-level laws. Secondly, you know, Republicans have done a much better job winning control of state legislatures. I mean, to this day, there's still some good pro-life Democrats out there who do good, important work, 
But in every state at the national level, Republicans are much, much better on this issue. And, you know, as a child of the 90s, I remember way back when, at one point, Republicans controlled both chambers of the legislature in very few states. In 1992, Republicans controlled both chambers of the state legislature in only eight states. That's up to 30 right now. So Republicans have won more and more state legislative chambers, makes it much, much easier to pass these good, strong, solid, protective pro-life laws. So what effects do all these laws have? And that's my research interest. You know, I'll just give you a quick summary. Uh, you know, public funding limits. You know, again, sadly, I should start off by saying, thankfully, we have the Hyde Amendment at the federal level. You know, the Hyde Amendment, you know, limits the ability of the federal Medicaid program to pay for elective abortions. Sadly, though, uh, some states use their own taxpayer dollars to fund abortions through Medicaid. And some states have changed their policy off and on. Uh, thankfully, West Virginia uh, is no longer funding abortions through their state Medicaid program. But unfortunately, in recent years, both Illinois and Maine have decided to start funding abortion through their state Medicaid program. But we can look at what happened. And from a kind of a research perspective, uh, the best thing we can do legislatively, short of banning abortion, is defunding abortion. And the research is very clear. Once the state Medicaid program stops funding abortion, abortion numbers go down. The abortion rate falls anywhere from 5 to 10%. So a lot of research on this from different states, you know, different kinds of academic journals, a very solid finding. You know, you quit funding abortion, abortion numbers go down. Again, the Hyde Amendment, you know, which is passed every year, which sadly President Biden now opposes, um, you know, research has showed it saved over 1 million lives. Except for reproductive rights, obviously group supports legal abortion, their analysis indicated the Hyde Amendment saved a million lives. I did a study for the Charlotte Lozier Institute, first released in 2016, updated in 2020, showing the Hyde Amendment has saved over 2.4 million lives. So please, don't let anyone tell you that pro-life political involvement has been for naught. You know, one of the first things we did as a movement was really emphasize getting the federal government out of the business of funding abortion. And because of our efforts, millions of lives have been saved and the conscience rates of millions of taxpayers have been protected. So Hyde Amendment has done quite a lot of good. It's under attack right now. Uh, thankfully, our Republican allies in Congress are holding firm, but it's a battle we're going to have to continue to fight for a long time, considering that Joe Biden and other Democrats want to do away with Hyde. They not only want abortion legal, you know, they want it paid for with our taxpayer dollars. Parental involvement laws. Again, these are laws that require minor girls to either notify their parents or receive permission from their parents for obtaining an abortion. Very strong body of research. If you pass a parental involvement law, that reduces in-state minor abortion rates. The minor girls simply won't obtain abortions or less likely to if they have to notify their parents. You get parents involved in the decision, their minor girls don't get abortions. And, you know, it is true sometimes these laws are circumvented by girls going to other states with laws that are more permissive. But there's been research on this, and the in-state decline always exceeds any out-of-state increase. Furthermore, there's also research showing that, you know, in the short term, minor birth rates go up after these laws are passed. So some girls who've otherwise had abortions carried these pregnancies to term after the parental involvement law took effect. So these laws have been effective at well, as well. Finally, informed consent laws. You know, there's not much of this research here. You know, there are three states looking at the Mississippi law that was passed or enacted in 1993. But I've done research showing that, you know, when these laws are well designed, you know, and enforced, you know, they do lower abortion rates there from about 2% to 10%. You know, give women an alternative, Sometimes they take the alternative. I mean, these laws aren't magical, but again, you let women know about alternatives to abortion, sometimes they will take the alternative. So informed consent laws can be a very powerful tool to get abortion numbers down as well. Now, suppose you don't believe anything I've told you for the past 40 minutes. Suppose you just think I'm some snake oil salesman that Lear Smith suit brought here to try to convince you that pro-life laws work. Well, you don't need a fancy green statistics to learn about the impact of pro-life laws. You can just look at some simple line charts. So this is Tennessee. Uh, the black dotted line is a national average. The red line is the abortion rate in Tennessee. And you see what happens. Tennessee passes informed consent. Abortion numbers go down. They pass parental notification. Abortion numbers go down. The court strikes down parental notice. Abortion numbers go up. Parental notification is reenacted. Abortion numbers go back down. So that's a nice line graph. So skeptical, look at Pennsylvania. You know, the green line is the abortion rate in Pennsylvania. The blue line is the national average. Uh, at one point, Pennsylvania used to fund abortions through the state Medicaid program. Thankfully, in the early 80s, they quit doing that. So the abortion rate went from being way above average to just being a little bit above average. Then, after the Casey decision, the Abortion Control Act took effect. That included a waiting period. That included a parental involvement law. 
That included informed consent law. You see, when that takes effect, the abortion numbers fall kind of beneath the national average. So again, you know, very clear that, you know, the pro-life laws they passed in Pennsylvania have been effective at getting the abortion rate down. So we'll talk about Dobbs. So we made a lot of progress under Roe v. Wade. Even with Roe on the books, we cut the abortion rate by half. So we're going to make even a lot more progress now that Roe's finally overturned. The future is here. So right now, as we speak, in 14 states, unborn children are now protected throughout pregnancy. So I have the states listed there. I'm not going to list them all. But we're now protecting pre-born children in 14 states. Furthermore, in Georgia, the unborn protected after a fetal heartbeat can be detected around six weeks gestation. And in Florida, Governor DeSantis signed a bill that protects unborn children after 15 weeks gestation. So we're on the move in many states. Guttmacher predicts that, you know, once things get sorted out, about 26 states will have laws in place protecting the pre-born. So in those states, you know, over 300,000 abortions were performed in 2020. So these laws could save literally hundreds of thousands of lives. Literally as many as 882 children every day. So there's a lot of exciting possibilities for passing good laws that can protect hundreds of thousands of unborn children. And there's more good news. So not only are we passing laws, but more women are seeking pregnancy help. Heartbeat International, you know, which, uh, you know, runs a nice, impressive chain of pregnancy help centers. They've said since Dobbs, they're hot on to see a 15% increase in calls seeking assistance. And this is a serious increase. These are not crank calls. So more and more people are calling pregnancy centers seeking help. They've also said that over half their pregnancy centers have seen an increase in clients. So after Dobbs, you know, more women are turning to pregnancy help centers for assistance. That's good news. And even more good news, you know, in the Lone Star State, a record number of children are being born. So that shows that more and more pregnancies are being carried to term. The Heartbeat Act, which took effect in September, is having an impact. So I'm going to be doing a study on this very shortly. I think it's important to document, you know, the good work we're doing. A lot of people have tried to downplay the Heartbeat Act. New York Times claimed that, you know, women are just going to other states. You're getting chemical abortion pills through the mail. We have data on births. And birth numbers in Texas are going up. Depending on what baseline you use, already in 2022, there'll be either 4,000 to 9,000 more births have taken place. So this just provides, I think, irrefutable evidence that the Heartbeat Act and other pro-life laws are saving lives. So, you know, some women are circumventing the law. Some women might be illegally getting chemical abortion pills through the mail. I mean, laws aren't perfect, but they're having a positive impact. Again, in Texas, more and more women are giving birth. You know, more children are being born. You know, that really does show the Heartbeat Act and other pro-life laws have been effective. Now, sometimes we give talks in parts of the country you know, where it's not always possible to enact laws protecting pre-born children. But one thing I've always said is no matter where you are, there's always things you can do to build a culture of life. So one thing we can do is run TV ads. There's a group out in St. Louis, I guess Jefferson City, Missouri, called the Vitae Caring Foundation. And they've done some interesting research. They've looked at an important question. Why do some women facing unattended pregnancies choose abortion while others carry that pregnancy a term? And their findings are really interesting. You know, what they found was that knowledge of, like, field development didn't really affect decisions that much. So knowing when fingers and toes develop or the heart starts to beat or when brain waves start, that did not have much of an impact on the decision of women. What did have an impact was how women viewed motherhood. So they started running some commercials with a bit of a different message. The pro-life commercials they ran made the case that motherhood could be an empowering choice. And anecdotally, these ads have been very effective. You know, they've generated lots of calls to pregnancy help centers. There's a story. I'm not sure it's true, but if it's not true, I think it should be. There's a story. They were running an ad campaign in Maine. And this ad campaign was so effective that abortion facilities were literally throwing their TVs out of the waiting room. Because someone would be in the waiting room, see the ad, get up and leave. So I don't know if that's true or not, but I think it's a great story, so I hope it is true. Uh, we also see a lot more public support for pregnancy help centers. You know, it's think that uh, instead of, you know, supporting Planned Parenthood, which destroys human life, you know, we should support life-forming alternatives like pregnancy help centers. You know, Texas has an alternative to abortion program. They have millions of dollars in funding every year. You know, other states have followed suit. So I think that's an exciting development. You know, ultrasound technology gets better every year. I think that's having an important impact on this debate. And finally, no matter where you are, if there's an abortion facility, you can sidewalk console. You know, every morning, you know, there's hearty souls that wake up, go to abortion facilities, try to offer options, alternatives to women in need. I'm pleased to say that I help organize sidewalk counseling efforts here at the D.C. Planned Parenthood. If you want to join us, you know, please talk to me. 
We always need more people praying on the sidewalk. I think that's a great, great ministry. We just had our 40 Days for Life kickoff rally. Uh, this was, I guess, uh, about a week ago. It was last Tuesday. Uh, Father Frank Pavone spoke. We have about almost 50 people there in front of the facility praying. So again, if you want to help with 40 Days for Life or help the sidewalk counseling ministry, uh, please talk to me. Uh, if you just want to come once a month or even every other month, you know, we'd love to have you. The more people praying on the sidewalk, the better. Now, not everything is, you know, positive. You know, there are some things you should be concerned about. You know, we had a long decline in the abortion rate, but starting around 2019 or so, abortion numbers started to go up a little bit. I think that's partly due to the fact that more and more chemical abortions are happening. You know, the other side is trying very hard to push chemical abortions. They want to make it possible for women to obtain chemical abortion pills without an in-person medical exam. You know, I think that's terrible public health. You know, chemical abortions are always failed to the unborn child, but they pose health risks to women. If a woman has an ectopic pregnancy and tries to get a chemical abortion, that can be fatal. If a woman is further along in gestation, she realizes, and she obtains chemical abortion, that could pose serious health increases. So we need to push back against chemical abortions. Sadly, some liberal states are appealing pro-life laws. I already said that Illinois and Maine have started to fund abortion through their state Medicaid program. Illinois also uh, repealed their pro-life parental involvement law. Massachusetts weakened their pro-life parental involvement law. So these are things we have to push back against. The Biden administration is certainly no friend, friend of pro-lifers. You know, President Biden, you know, thinks abortion should be legal. He also, after he's supporting the Hyde Amendment, now opposes Hyde. So does President Biden think abortion should be legal. He wants us to pay for it with our taxpayer dollars. So he wants to, you know, force us to pay for abortion with taxes. He repealed the Mexico City policy, you know, which used to uh, limit the ability of federal aid money to go to any, you know, so now our federal aid dollars can go to NGOs, that promote or perform abortions overseas. So again, uh, he's made it very clear he's no friend of pro-lifers and he's doing what he can to expand abortion. He also repealed the Trump administration Protect Life rule that excluded Planned Parenthood from certain government grants. And there has been a little bit of an uptick in pro-choice sentiment since Dobbs. You know, I think the media hasn't really been kind to us since Dobbs. You know, one thing we do know from studying public opinion is it tends to react to current events. I think it's a short-term blip. You know, I don't think it will last but something we do need to concern ourselves with a bit. And again, you know, Roe v. Wade, the reversal, is, was a great thing. Uh, law of opportunities, but lots of challenges. You know, our work is not over. We need to pass pro-life laws in the states. We need to enforce these pro-life laws. The other side is going to try to circumvent these laws. So we need to, you know, find ways to stop things like mail-order chemical abortions. I said before that, you know, these mail-order abortions pose serious health risks. We need to push back against that. Also, you know, laws are important, but they're not magical. You know, women will try to travel to states, you know, and try to get, get abortions in states where the laws are more permissive. So again, you know, we need to think about making sure that women do know that, you know, there are good life-forming options available and really promote and advertise the good work of our pregnancy centers, you know, in the various states. So, you know, the reversal of Roe v. Wade has given us lots of opportunities, lots of challenges as well, but I think we'll be up for it. But more importantly, I just want to end on a positive note because there's plenty of reasons why we as pro-lifers should be optimistic. First, as I said, we control more and more state legislatures. It makes it much easier to pass good protective laws. We're passing more laws every year. You know, I think it's great that you know, as many states have passed pro-life laws after Dobbs as has taken place. Young people you know, are a lot more involved. Uh, Shohanna Faith from Students for Life is here. She is the capital area you know, coordinator. She's doing great work uh, organizing pro-life high school and college students in the D.C. area. Uh, students for Life uh, really got off the ground around 2006, 2007. You know, I always thought that pro-lifers haven't always invested as much as we should have in youth outreach, uh, but they've done great work. They've helped me at every school I've been at. Uh, I can't speak enough of the good work they do giving pro-life college students the tools and training they need. Uh, there's all kinds of great pro-life outreach ministries. I go on and on. I like Silent No More. I think post-abortive women have very powerful testimonies. They're doing great work. I like what Feminists for Life is doing. They're trying to make college campuses more accommodating places for pregnant students and parenting students. Uh, I think Four Days for Life is doing great work, getting more and more people to pray outside of abortion facilities. So we have lots of great outreach efforts. Planned Parents getting the scrutiny they deserve. Again, I'm a child and someone who came of age in the 90s. Defunding Planned Parenthood was not even on the radar screen way back when. This is an issue that Republicans wouldn't touch. Now we've got most Republicans on board with defunding Planned Parenthood. We have a ways to go yet, but we have made progress. 
and several states have defunded Planned Parenthood. So they're getting the scrutiny they deserve. You know, the undercover videos done by people like Lila Rose and David DeLayden have, I think, really turned public sentiment against Planned Parenthood. So that's been a good development. You know, we've made some long-term gains in support of the pro-life position. You know, abortion numbers going down long-term. That's a great development. And finally, after you know, 49 years of blood, sweat, and tears, we finally succeeded in overturning Roe v. Wade, and we could finally start passing laws protecting pre-born children. So, some parting words. You know, we're going to have some internal debates about strategy. You know, you see that happening in many states. You know, states want to protect pre-born children, but every state's different. And, you know, based on the politics of the state and public opinion, you know, different approaches might work well in different states. So, we're going to have some important internal discussions. So, one thing I would say, if you just disagree with other pro-lifers, Please be charitable. You know, infighting has done a lot of damage to the pro-life movement. We're not always going to agree. We're not always going to like each other. We have the same goal in mind, protecting pre-born children. So if you do disagree, please be so charitable. Please, please, please don't let infighting hinder our efforts. So I'm going to have some conclusions here. So the airing of grievances, feats of physical strength, and the festivus pull. I'm seeing who's paying attention. You know, I just throw a slide in here like this. Sometimes it's a long day. People are tired. So this is from Seinfeld. These are not the real conclusions. Here are the conclusions. Probably succeeding cutting the abortion rate by more than 50% with Roe on the books. We're going to make even more progress now that Roe's overturned. That's very exciting. Now, suppose you didn't pay attention to anything I said. Suppose you were eating your bacon and eggs, or you were tired, or you were distracted, and you just ignored everything I said. Okay, that's fine. There's one thing I want you to remember. We have made progress. You know, for over 49 years, pro have worked tirelessly to protect pre-born children. Progress has not always come as quickly as we would have liked, but if every conference we stay the course, victory will someday be ours. Thank you. So, all right, we have about 10 minutes, and I'll stay longer if you want. Uh, looks like we have a lot of – want to give a quick shot to Larry Sirignano, who does some great pro-life work himself. He has a question in the back. Michael, how many uh, teenagers are having babies, especially in Texas? Uh, you know, and how many of those numbers are going up? Off the top of my head, you know, I don't have an age breakdown. You know, I have some data from the state health department about total births. Uh, you know, I will do more detailed research on this to kind of look at the age demographics of uh, the women giving birth. Uh, but how many of those women are teenagers? I just simply do not know. And nationally, it's about 7%. Yeah, I mean, teen pregnancy rates have gone down a lot. You know, we've done a good job getting teen pregnancy numbers down by quite a lot. Uh, and one important reason for that is that teen sexual activity has declined. You know, that gets very little attention. But since the 90s, there's two separate studies, uh, National Survey of Family Growth, and Youth Risk Behavior Survey show consistent declines in teen sexual activity since the 90s. So it's not caught reception, you know, necessarily. It's declines in teen sexual activity. So teen pregnancy rates have gone down by quite a lot. And it's partly, again, um, you know, I think part, you know, in large part due to reductions in teen sexual activity. Yes, you in the back. Questions? We're going to get you a mic. Oh, so okay. thank you for everyone who does have questions. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, my question has to do more with uh, federal tactics on the legislative front. So there's many different things we can do, the grassroots activist uh, side, but I'm interested to know, do you recommend that there be any legislative action? Do you think defunding would be the most effective action, defunding uh, pro-choice centers, or would it be outright bans? Uh, if so, what kinds, how many weeks? Um, what do you think would be the most effective thing to push for? Well, the most effective thing we could push for would be legislation that would protect all pre-born children throughout all stages of development. I think a federal ban on abortion is not going to happen tomorrow. You know, I think we just have to move forward prudentially and pass the most protective laws we can. Obviously, you know, Republican Joe Biden's in the White House. Republicans don't control right now a majority of either the House or the Senate. You know, that limits what we can do. Uh, political winds, I think, will start blowing a different direction. You know, we will elect a pro-life president, hopefully in 2024. You know, I think there's a good chance that Republicans will control the House, and I think a pretty good chance they'll control the Senate after this election cycle. Uh, not all Republicans who we elect are always pro-life or would, you know, be willing to amenable to passing strong pro-life laws. So I just think that we need to move prudentially. 
You know, I think we should pass the most protective laws we can. You know, I think Senator Graham's proposed 15-week abortion ban is a positive first step. You know, I think the polling data is very clear that, you know, most Americans reject abortion in the third trimester and second trimester. I think it kind of exposes the extreme positions uh, that many Democrats have on this issue. I just think we have to move forward just prudentially. We should pass the most protective laws we can um, and just do what we can. Uh, I think defunding Planned Parenthood is a great idea. Uh, I think hopefully that's something we do pursue the next time we elect a pro-life president, but it's going to be difficult. You know, the filibuster rules make it tough to pass things through the Senate. And again, you do have some Republicans who aren't completely on board. You know, the Republican Party has gotten a lot better on this issue lately, uh, but there's some people who aren't quite on board yet. So I just think, you know, we should, you know, we shouldn't just leave it to the states. The federal government has an important role to play. We just have to move forward prudentially and pass the most protective laws that we can. Dr. New, ever since uh, the Dobbs decision, of course, the constant drumbeat of the media has been that, that the abortion issue is toxic to Republicans. And the, the, the narrative is that if they pull this election out, that it'll be because of the abortion issue. And one of the statistics, statistics that they constantly point to is uh, polls that show that people who rank uh, on the pro-abortion side as their number one issue, abortion has been growing. So how would you respond to candidates to, uh, to convince them to reject this lie? Well, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. Uh, first off, the polling on this question is very interesting. When they just sort of ask people what issues are most important to you, people often say, you know, inflation uh, or the economy or gas prices. Typically, if they're just asked, they won't say abortion. But if they're prompted, you know, what do you, do you think abortion is important? You know, they'll say yes. So I think that some people are kind of answering yes to the abortion question because they're kind of prompted in a certain way. You know, they're kind of giving the answer that perhaps they think the pollster or the survey research form, you know, wants them to give. Um, you know, what advice do I have? You know, I think that, you know, we can make strong arguments on behalf of protecting preborn children. I think they're good, strong arguments. I don't think we need to hide from this issue. I also think we need to expose the extremists of the other side. I mean, our opponents for the most part, you know, want to see abortion legal throughout all nine months of pregnancy. You know, that's not a position that many Americans support. Our opponents, for the most part, want to see abortions paid for with taxpayer dollars. You know, pretty much every Democrat running for federal office is on record opposing the Hyde Amendment. That's something I think Republican candidates should talk about quite a lot. You know, people really don't want to pay more taxes and see that money going for abortion. So I just think that we need, need to be scared of the issue. I think we can make good, strong, compelling arguments to protect pre-born children. We don't need to hide from it. We don't need to run from it. We just need to make our case and make it well. And also talk about other things. I mean, the Biden administration gives us all kinds of things to talk about every day, whether it's inflation, you know, whether it's gas prices, you know, whether it's the economy. Uh, there's plenty of things to talk about. So, you know, we don't need to fixate on abortion. But when it comes up, we shouldn't hide from it either. Okay, so I'll get the person with the microphone. We have time for two more questions. Any any folks over there yeah. before I hand the mic? And over? I'll stick around. If anyone wants to talk to me personally, yep. I'm not going to okay. run away. So, uh, thank you. <clears throat> I'm Dino Drudy. Um, what about the the downstream effects of this success of recognizing preborn children as legal persons, which in a roundabout way, Roe v. Wade said, no, no, they're not. Now that it's gone, what other kinds of consequences legally, fiscally, economically, might there be from this? We sometimes hear this is the quiet part, that all these unwanted children will increase the crime rate and more welfare, cost more welfare, on and on. Some of the increase in Texas's birth rate may be from people who are illegally present in our country having anchor babies. On and on go the list of possible long-term consequences. Is the pro-life movement, and particularly the think tank you, you discussed, thinking about these long-term consequences, one of which could be 50, 25 years from now, more liberals and Democrats. Well, I th we are thinking about the consequences of it. I mean, right now, um, you know, there's obviously going to be, you know, 
more children being born uh, because of the good pro-life laws we have. You know, we just had a very good panel at Catholic University about adoption and adoption policy. You know, I think we need to find ways to streamline that. Uh, there's many families eager to adopt. And if there's more pregnancies being carried to term, potentially there might be more women interested in adoption. You know, I think that's an issue that Lozier Institute wants to work on. And that might be something we can work on in a bipartisan way. I mean, there are even our, you know, Democrat colleagues, even if they aren't pro-life, you know, many of them do think adoption is, is a good thing and we should, you know, assist that. You know, another thing is that, you know, the fact that people are having more kids is a good thing. You know, I teach a class on the federal budget. And uh, one problem we have with a lot of our programs is that people are living longer, which is a good thing, but they're having fewer kids. So with things like Social Security and Medicare, that means you have fewer workers supporting more retirees. You know, they got expensive. So I think the fact that, you know, we should frankly encourage people to have more kids and have large families. I mean, not just for the economics. I think that children are a blessing. Uh, but I think that the consequences of, you know, more children being born and more pregnancies being carried to term, you know, I think are positive ones. Obviously, I think we need to do what we can to make sure that we support mothers and, you know, we support people who uh, might be carrying pregnancies to term in situations that they didn't anticipate. You know, I think we need to be creative. But we are thinking about this. You know, pro-lifers, we care about, you know, human life uh, from conception until natural death. You know, we just don't discard people after they're born. You know, we want to make sure that people can thrive and flourish. And we want to make sure that families and parents, you know, remain strong, you know, that children have the tools they need to succeed. So, you know, we are thinking about adoption and children and other issues down the road. And, you know, I think these are exciting opportunities. And, you know, I'm looking forward to working with my colleagues at Lozier and elsewhere to building a culture of life. question there sure <clears throat> I was wondering if you have uh, done uh, studies about de the demographics of about who are keeping the kids now uh, whether it be immigrants because I know a lot of immigrants treasure the kids mm -hmm. as well as uh, America uh, uh, natives sometimes don't so can you t uh, have you can you discuss more about that yeah, you know, I'm not really an expert on the demographics of, of you know births. I mean, I think anecdotally, you know, many immigrants, you know, are having a lot of children. Um, you know, I don't have a lot of you know commentary to add, add beyond that. You know, I think children are, are a blessing, and you know, people in all circumstances, in all circumstances, deserve our, our support. Um, you know, again, I think that uh, you know, I'm excited by kind of the debates that we're having, you know, in conservative circles these days. You know, growing up in the '80s and '90s, it just seemed our economic policy was all about cutting taxes, cutting regulation, and letting markets do their magic. You know, now we're thinking more seriously about how do we really best support families. You know, let's have an economy that's more kind of family centric than individual centric. And, you know, there's going to be important internal debates, but I think doing more to you know, help families, you know, is a good thing. You know, having a larger child tax credit, you know, doing certain things to, you know, help out parents, especially large families. You know, I think these are, you know, important debates. And, you know, I think the Republican Party can do well for itself by really making itself, you know, the family-friendly party. A lot of questions here. This is good. So I uh, have a question kind of following off of uh, what you're talking about here. Um, often the right gets criticized for uh, our policy stances being very defensive. Um, and I think the pro-life movement is actually a really good example of where we've uh, reclaimed territory. Uh, but uh, now that we have uh, gotten the Dobbs decision and we're kind of advancing forward in the states, um, what can we do in terms of supporting pro-natalist policy as a pro-life movement to go on the offense against the left? That's a very good question. I mean, uh, I think that... Um you know, I'm not an expert on the details, but I'm, you know, intrigued by the legislation put forth by Senator Romney, uh, and I think also Senator Rubio uh, put legislation forward that would, you know, try to create a more family-friendly tax code, you know, whether it's, um, you know, a larger child tax credit, you know, whether it's, you know, more assistance for parents who uh, want to send their kids to religious or private schools. You know, I think that, again, I'm not going to support blanketly everything going on, but I think, you know, what's going on in Hungary is, I think, worth looking at and worth thinking about. I mean, you do see what's happening in some countries that are, um, you know, facing a situation where few people are having kids. You know, they're really subsidizing children. 
And uh, I'm not sure we need to you know, go that far, uh, but I do think that you know, the legislation put forth by Senator Romney and Senator Rubio deserves serious thought and serious consideration. You know, I do think that, you know, a more, you know, again, the Republicans kind of positioning themselves as a stronger, you know, pro-life, pro-family party, you know, I think could pay some real dividends down the road. And uh, I think this is things that, you know, conservative policymakers and think tankers uh, should give a lot of thought to. I think... I think some hands are up. I'm happy to stay and answer every last question people have. I don't have to be anywhere for a good while. So you've been a great audience, and thank you for your time and attention. I'm David Fenner. I'm Vice President of Programs here at LI. Our MC had to get to the Capitol Hill to conduct a training, so I'm taking over for Stephen. Um, Dr. New, thank you so much.